ever lay awake at night wondering what humanity will be like in like a hundred years. I know. I mean, really wondering. Yeah. Well, Muhammad Amin has got some wild theories. He does. In his book, Singularitarianism, Quantum Nano. Mm-hmm. He's taking us on this deep dive into the future. Okay. A future with like super advanced technology, right. AI that might just, you know, outsmart us all. Sure. <laughs> and philosophical questions about what it even means to be human. Yeah. What's fascinating about Amin's book is that he doesn't just like throw out these futuristic ideas. Right. He connects them back to the entire history of humanity. Right. Like in chapter one, he walks us through this like whirlwind tour of human history, you know? Yeah. From discovering fire uh -huh. to inventing the wheel yeah. to boom the internet and AI. Right. And his point is that the speed of these huge leaps forward, mm -hmm. it's getting faster and faster. Exactly. He argues it's not just progress, it's exponential progress. Okay. Each invention builds on the one before it accelerating our advancement. So the gap between, say, the first tools in agriculture. Yeah is yeah. huge GE compared to the time between the first computer and landing on the moon. Okay, so that makes sense, but where's this all headed? Right. I mean, besides humanity needing to seriously upgrade its internet speed to keep up. Well, Amin argues that this accelerating progress is leading us straight to the singularity. Uh -huh. The moment when AI surpasses human intelligence. Okay. And he doesn't think this is some far off sci-fi concept. Right. He's talking about the second half of the 21st century, yeah. which is alarmingly soon. So picture this. Okay. It's the year, say, 2075. Okay. Our world is dominated by AI and robots. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we're all sipping cocktails on the beach while robots do our work? Right. Or are we battling robot overlords in a post-apocalyptic wasteland? Well, Amin explores both the utopian and dystopian possibilities. Okay. But in chapter two, he gets real about the current global chaos. Okay. He argues we're already seeing the disruptive effects of technology, political and economic upheaval, information overload. Yeah, remember that time the internet was supposed to unite us all? Oh, yeah. And it kind of did the opposite, right? Totally. More like information overload equals tribalism. Yeah. Everyone retreating into their own little echo chamber. Exactly. Amin calls this the paradox of choice. Right. More information, more choices should be good. Right. But it can also yeah. lead to paralysis, mm -hmm. anxiety, and yeah. people clinging even tighter to their existing biases. All right. It's like being in a giant supermarket with yeah. a million different types of cereal, mm. but you end up grabbing the same box you always do. Oh, I feel that. Right. Too many choices. Too many choices. But back to the robots and AI. Okay. How are we supposed to survive in a world where they're potentially doing all the jobs? That's where Amin gets really radical. Okay. In chapter three, he talks about things like a robo tax uh -huh. or an AI tax. Okay. Basically taxing the work done by machines to support the humans who are no longer needed for those jobs. So like instead of my paycheck, my robot butler gets paid and then the government takes a cut of his earnings to support me. Exactly. But the most intriguing idea he proposes yeah. is a universal basic income UBI. Okay. Everyone gets a guaranteed income regardless of whether they work or not. Okay. It's a safety net, but it also allows people to pursue their passions, mm. to focus on creative endeavors, or simply to enjoy life without the constant pressure of having to earn a living. Okay. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. I mean, it sounds kind of utopian. Yeah. Everyone gets their basic needs met, free to follow their dreams. Right. But wouldn't that make people lazy? That's a common concern, and Amin addresses it directly. Okay. He argues that UBI wouldn't eliminate work altogether. Right. It would just reshape our relationship with it. Interesting. People would be free to pursue work they find meaningful and fulfilling, rather than being forced into jobs they hate just to survive. So it's less about being lazy and more about finding your purpose. Exactly. Okay. And that leads us to another fascinating aspect of Amin's vision of the future. Okay. In chapter four, he argues that this rapid technological advancement won't just change our society and economy. Mm -hmm. It will actually change us as humans. Oh, here we go. Here we go. This is where things get really sci-fi, right? Oh, right. He talks about these three categories of future humanity. Okay. Classical humans, mm. hybrid humans, uh -huh. and transhumans. Okay, I need a breakdown here. What's the difference? Well, classical humans are basically us. Okay. Humans as we exist today without any significant technological enhancement. Okay, got it. So like no upgrades. 
Right. Hybrid humans are those who have adopted some level of technological integration, okay. like prosthetics, mm. genetic modifications, or maybe even brain-computer interfaces. Whoa. Brain-computer interfaces? Yeah, like yeah. plugging your brain into a computer? Isn't that straight out of the Matrix? Exactly. Oh, well. And then there are the transhumans, beings who have fully embraced technological enhancement, essentially merging with machines to transcend their biological limitations. Okay. Think uploading your consciousness into a virtual world or even becoming some kind of hybrid human machine intelligence. Okay, now my head is officially spinning. Yeah. So we've got regular humans, mm -hmm. humans with upgrades, and humans who are basically cyborgs. Yeah. And they're all going to be sharing this future Earth. That's the picture Amin paints. And he doesn't shy away from the potential conflicts that could arise between these different types of humans. Yeah, I can imagine. Imagine debates about rights and access, mm -hmm. ethical dilemmas about consciousness and identity. Right. It's a whole new frontier of philosophical and social challenges. This is a lot to take in. Yeah. But before we get lost in the future where I might be arguing with my robot neighbor about property lines, I have to ask. Okay. How does it mean think we're going to navigate this crazy new world? Right. Is there some kind of plan or are we just winging it? Well, Amin proposes a system called Singularitarianism, quantum nano, a mouthful of not. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, it's a system designed to ensure equal opportunity for all conscious entities, regardless of whether they're classical hybrid or transhuman. So, like, even if I'm just a regular human hanging out in my ton upgraded body. Yeah. I still have the same rights and opportunities as a cyborg with a supercomputer for a brain. Exactly. Wow. He talks about evolving human rights to include things like access to brain-computer interfaces and quantum computing. Right. Because in a world where those technologies exist, not having access to them could create a massive divide between those who have and those who have not. Wow. It's like we're not just talking about access to healthcare or education anymore. Right. We're talking about access to the very tools of consciousness in existence. That's the radical shift in thinking that Amin is proposing. Yeah. And he really pushes the listener to imagine this new world asking, imagine a world where human rights are redefined for a technologically advanced society. Mm. What rights would you prioritize? That's a heavy question. Yeah. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what to have for dinner tonight, and now I'm supposed to be redefining human rights for the cyborg era. Well, that's the beauty of Amin's book. Okay. It forces you to think about these big existential questions, even if you don't have all the answers. Yeah. And trust me, things are going to get even wilder as we mm. dive deeper into his vision of the 23rd century and beyond. All right, I'm ready for it. Bring on the future. <laughs> so we've talked about AI potentially outsmarting us, uh, humanity splitting into different types with varying levels of tech integration and even redefining human rights for the cyborg era. Right. Where does Amin go from there? Well, you know, Amin, he's not stopping at some, like, slightly upgraded future. Right. In Chapter 5, he jumps way ahead to the 23rd century and beyond. Okay. And starts exploring this idea of humanity becoming, yeah. wait for it, mm -hmm. godlike. It is a mind-bending concept. It is. But Amin argues it's a natural progression of this accelerating technological advancement he's been talking about. If we keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible, who's to say we won't eventually reach a point where we can manipulate the universe itself? Okay, hold on manipulating the universe. Yeah. Are we talking about like bending spoons with our minds or creating black holes for fun? Right. What does godlike even mean in this context? Well, Amin doesn't get into the specifics of what powers a godlike humanity might possess. Okay. Instead, he focuses on the philosophical implications of such a scenario. Okay. He asks us to imagine what it would mean for our understanding of ourselves, our purpose, our place in the cosmos. So less about the superpowers, more about the existential crisis that comes with being a god. Exactly. And this is where Amin's exploration of different philosophical traditions becomes really fascinating. Okay. He contrasts Western, often Abrahamic views of God with Eastern and specifically Javanese philosophies. Right, because in the West, the idea of God is often tied to this concept of dominion over nature. Right? Yeah. Humans is the chosen ones ruling over creation. Precisely. And Amin argues that this kind of thinking can be inherently problematic. Okay. Especially when you start talking about a humanity with godlike powers. Yeah. He sees it as a recipe for potential conflict exploitation, even destruction. I can see that. Right. 
If we're already struggling to manage our planet with our current level of technology, right. imagine giving a species with a dominion over nature mentality the ability to control the very fabric of reality. Yeah. That sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Exactly. And that's where Amin points to Eastern and Javanese philosophies as potential alternatives. Okay. He talks about the Javanese concept of Manangaling Kawula Gusti, mm -hmm. which emphasizes unity with the universe, emerging of the individual consciousness with the cosmic consciousness. So instead of dominating the universe, we become one with it. Right. And it's like that saying, be the change you want to see in the world, but on a cosmic scale. Precisely. And this idea of unity ties into another Javanese concept that Amin highlights, mm -hmm. Mama Yuhayuning Bawana. Mm -hmm. It's about beautifying the universe, contributing to its harmony and flourishing. So it's less about imposing our will on the cosmos and more about nurturing its potential working in concert with it. Yeah. Kind of like a cosmic gardener tending to a vast and intricate garden. That's a great analogy. Thanks. And Amin contrasts these ideas with the Abrahamic concept of a singular absolute God, arguing that this kind of thinking can lead to rigidity, intolerance, and even violence. Yeah, I can see how the idea of one absolute truth, especially when it's tied to a specific religion or ideology, can lead to conflicts. Yeah. Throughout history, people have been willing to fight and die for their beliefs, even when those beliefs clash with others. Exactly. And Amin worries that if humanity achieves godlike powers while clinging to this kind of absolute thinking, uh -huh. the consequences could be catastrophic. Yeah. Imagine a species capable of manipulating reality, but convinced that their way is the only right way. Right. It's a recipe for cosmic level conflict. Okay. So Eastern and Javanese philosophies mm -hmm. offer a more harmonious maybe even pacifistic approach to godhood. Mm. But Amin also brings up another concept, right? Something about moksha. Yes, moksha is a key concept in many Eastern spiritual traditions, including Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay. It refers to liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth, a state of perfect peace and freedom from suffering. So if achieving godhood is like reaching the top of Mount Everest, yeah. moksha is like just floating away into the clouds, leaving all earthly concerns behind. That's a good way to put it. Okay. And Amin presents moksha as a potential path for a godlike humanity. Okay. He suggests that instead of endlessly pursuing power or manipulating the universe, a truly advanced species might seek a state of transcendence beyond material concerns. It's like saying, okay, we've reached the pinnacle of technological and spiritual advancement. Now what? And the answer, according to some traditions, is to let go of everything, even our own existence as individual beings. Exactly. And this idea of transcendence, of seeking something beyond the material world, yeah. challenges our usual assumptions about progress and what it means to be powerful. It suggests that true power might lie in letting go and merging with something larger than ourselves, even if that means dissolving our individual identities. Wow. That's a lot to wrap my head around. Yeah. So we've got these different visions of godlike humanity dominating the universe, becoming one with it, or transcending it altogether. Right. It's like choosing your own adventure, but with cosmic level consequences. And that's what makes Amin's exploration of these ideas so fascinating. Yeah. He's not giving us a roadmap to godhood or telling us which path is right or wrong. Okay. He's asking us to consider the possibilities to grapple with the philosophical and ethical implications of a future where humanity might reach a level of power we can barely even imagine. He's basically throwing down the gauntlet, challenging us to think about what kind of gods we would choose to be right. Exactly. And that's a question we'll continue to explore as we dive into Amin's final thoughts in his epilogue. All right, I'm ready for the grand finale. Let's hear what Amin has to say about the ultimate fate of humanity and the universe. Okay, so we've journeyed through Amin's vision of humanity's future, yeah. from the singularity to the rise of different human types, and even the possibility of us becoming godlike beings. It's a lot to process. What's the final message Amin leaves us with in his epilogue? Well, he calls it the anti-entropy epilogue, okay. which uh, sounds pretty intense, Yeah. but it's where he brings together all these threads, okay. technology, philosophy, the future of humanity, mm. and boils it down to a fundamental question about the direction of the universe itself. Entropy. That, that, that's about <laughs> disorder, right? Like how everything eventually falls apart, even the universe. Exactly. Amin contrasts entropy with the concept of anti-entropy, okay. which is all about order, organization and complexity. Mm -hmm. He argues that humanity, with its drive to create, innovate, and push boundaries, yeah. is a force of anti-entropy in the universe. Yeah. So even though everything tends toward chaos, we're kind of like these little pockets of order. 
constantly building and shaping and pushing against the tide of entropy. That's the idea. And this ties back to Amin's exploration of different philosophies for a godlike humanity. Oh, no wait. Remember how he contrasted the Abrahamic idea of dominion over nature with the Javanese concepts of unity and harmony with the universe? Yeah, the Manangaling Kawula Gusti and Mauyu Hayuning Bawana concepts. Mm. Big words but basically about merging with the universe and beautifying it. Right. Amin argues that these philosophies reflect a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of all things, mm -hmm. a sense of responsibility for the well-being of the whole. Okay. He sees them as paths toward a future where humanity acts as a force for anti-entropy, not just on Earth, but on a cosmic scale. So instead of imposing our will on the universe, we become stewards of its beauty and complexity. Kind of like cosmic gardeners, but with even bigger responsibilities. Exactly. And this is where Amin issues a stark warning oh, about the dangers of clinging to the Abrahamic concept of God, the singular absolute authority who demands obedience and dominion over nature. Mm -hmm. He argues that this kind of thinking combined with godlike powers could lead to disaster. It's like giving a toddler who throws cantrums the ability to control the weather. Mm -hmm. Not exactly a recipe for a harmonious universe. Precisely. Amin contrasts this with the Javanese philosophy of Manangaling Kawula Gusti, okay. which he believes offers a more balanced and ultimately more sustainable approach to godhood. Right. It's about recognizing our interconnectedness with the universe, not seeking to dominate it. Okay, so Javanese philosophy gets points for cosmic harmony. But what about moksha, that idea of transcending the cycle of existence? Where does that fit in? That's a great question. Amin doesn't dismiss moksha outright. Okay. He acknowledges it as a valid path for those seeking liberation from suffering. Uh -huh. But he also suggests that achieving moksha on a mass scale might mean the end of humanity's role as a force for anti-entropy. So it's like choosing between becoming one with the universe actively shaping it for the better or just bowing out of the game altogether. In a way, yes. And Amin doesn't tell us which path is right or wrong. He leaves us with this profound question. What is the ultimate goal for a humanity that has achieved godlike abilities? That's a big one. Yeah. Do we try to play God merge with the universe or simply cease to exist? And the answer Amin suggests will depend on the choices we make today. Okay. The values we embrace, the technologies we develop, the philosophies we choose to guide us. So after all that, after exploring the singularity, transhumanism, godlike powers, and contrasting philosophies, Amin's message is that the future is ultimately up to us. That's the essence of it. Singularitarianism quantum nano isn't a prediction of what will happen, right. but an exploration of what could happen. It's a call to action urging us to think critically about the choices we make today and how they might shape the destiny of humanity and the universe. Woo. That's a lot to ponder. Hmm. I think I need to go for a walk in nature and contemplate my place in the cosmos for a while. That sounds like a good plan. And maybe just maybe as we walk, we can start imagining the kind of future we want to create. A future worthy of a truly godlike humanity. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into singularitarianism quantum nano. It's been a wild ride through the future filled with mind-blowing ideas and thought-provoking questions. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep those imaginations fired up.